uma produção WGBH Boston associada à Harvard University. Qual a coisa certa a fazer? Justice, com Michael Sandel. Contratação militar. When we ended last time, we were discussing Locke's idea of government by consent. And the question arose, what are the limits on government that even the agreement of the majority can't override? That was the question we ended with. We saw, in the case of property rights, that on Locke's view, a democratically elected government has the right to tax people. It has to be taxation with consent, because it does involve the taking of people's property for the common good. But it doesn't require the consent of each individual at the time the tax is enacted or collected. What it does require is a prior act of consent to join the society, to take on the political obligation. But once you take on that obligation, you agree to be bound by the majority. So much for taxation. But what you may ask about the right to life, can the government conscript people and send them into battle? What about the idea that we own ourselves? Isn't the idea of self-possession violated if the government can, through coercive legislation and enforcement powers, say, you must go risk your life to fight in Iraq? What would Locke say? Does the government have the right to do that? Yes. In fact, he says in 139, He says, what matters is that the political authority or the military authority not be arbitrary. That's what matters. And he gives a wonderful example. He says, a, a sergeant, even a sergeant, let alone a general, a sergeant can command a soldier to go right up to the face of a cannon where he is almost sure to die. That the sergeant can do. The general can condemn the soldier to death for deserting his post or for not obeying even a, a desperate order. But with all their power over life and death, what these officers can't do is take a penny of that soldier's money. because that has nothing to do with the rightful authority. That would be arbitrary, and it would be corrupt. So consent winds up being very powerful in Locke, not consent of the individual to the particular tax or military order, but consent to join the government and to be bound by the majority in the first place. That's the consent that matters. And it matters so powerfully that even the limited government created by the fact that we have an unalienable right to life, liberty, and property, even that limited government is only limited in the sense that it has to govern by generally applicable laws, the rule of law, it can't be arbitrary. That's Locke. Well, this raises a question about consent. Why is consent such a powerful moral instrument in creating political authority and the obligation to obey. Today we begin to investigate the question of consent by looking at a concrete case, the case of military conscription. Now some people say, if we have a fundamental right that arises from the idea that we own ourselves, It's a violation of that right 
for a government to conscript citizens to go fight in wars. Others disagree. Others say that's a legitimate power of government, of democratically elected governments anyhow, and that we have an obligation to obey. Let's take the case of the, the United States fighting a war in Iraq. News accounts tell us that the military is having great difficulty meeting its recruitment targets. Consider three policies that the U.S. government might undertake to deal with the fact that it's not achieving its recruiting targets. Solution number one, increase the pay and benefits to attract a sufficient number of soldiers. Option number two, shift to a system of military conscription. Have a lottery, and whosoever numbers are drawn, go to fight in Iraq. System number three, outsource. Hire what traditionally have been called mercenaries. People around the world who are qualified, able to do the work, able to fight well, and who are willing to do it for the existing wage. So let's take a quick poll here. How many favor increasing the pay? Huge majority. How many favor going to conscription? One, two. All right, maybe a dozen people in the room favor conscription. What about the outsourcing solution? Okay, so there may be uh, about two, three dozen. During the Civil War, the Union used a combination of conscription and the market system to fill the ranks of the military to fight in the Civil War. It was a system that began with conscription but if you were drafted and didn't want to serve, you could hire a substitute to take your place. And many people did. You could pay whatever the market required in order to find a substitute. People <coughs> ran ads in newspapers, in the classified ads, offering $500, sometimes $1,000 for a substitute who would go fight the Civil War in their place. In fact, it's reported that Andrew Carnegie was drafted and hired a substitute to take his place for an amount that was a little less than the amount he spent in a year on fancy cigars. Now, I want to get your views about the Civil War system. Call it the hybrid system. Conscription, but with a buyout provision. How many think it was a just system? How many would defend the Civil War system? Anybody? One? Anybody else? Two, three, four, five. How many think it was unjust? Most of you don't like the Civil War system. You think it's unjust. Let's hear an objection. Why don't you like it? What's wrong with it? Yes. Well, by paying $300 for, uh, to be exempt one time around, you're really putting a price on, the, uh, on valuing human life. And we established earlier that's really hard to do. So they're trying to accomplish something that really isn't feasible. Good, so, so paying someone 300 or 500 or 
You're basically saying that's what their life is worth to you. That's what their life is worth. It's putting a dollar value on life. That's good. And what's your name? Liz. Liz. Uh, well, who has an answer f for Liz? You defended the Civil War system. What do you say? If you don't like the price, then you have the freedom to not be sold or hired. So it's completely up to you. And it's, I don't think it's necessarily putting a specific price on you. And if it's done by himself, I don't think there's anything necessarily morally wrong with that. So the person who takes the $500, let's say, he's putting his own price on his life or on the risk of his life. And he should have the freedom to choose to do that. Exactly. What's your name? Jason. Jason, thank you. Now we need to hear from another critic of the Civil War system. Yes. It's a kind of coercion almost to people who have lower incomes. Um, for Carnegie, he can totally ignore the draft. $300 right. is you know, irrelevant in terms of his income. For right. someone of a lower income, they're essentially being coerced to draft to be drafted, or, um, I mean, it's probably they're not able to find a replacement. Or... Tell me your name. Sam. Sam. All right, so you say, Sam, that when a, when a poor laborer buys his, accepts $300 to fight in the Civil War, he is in effect being coerced by that money given his economic circumstances. Whereas Carnegie can go off, pay the money, and, and not serve. All right, I want to hear if someone has a reply to Sam's argument that what looks like a free exchange is actually coercive. Who has an answer to, to Sam? Go ahead. I'd actually agree with him in saying you that. You agree with Sam? I agree with him in saying that it is coercion in, in the sense that it robs individual of his ability to reason. Probably. Okay, and what's your name? Raul. All right, so Raul and Sam agree that what looks like a free exchange, free choice, voluntary act, is actually, co it, it involves coercion. It's profound coercion of the worst kind because it falls so disproportionately upon one segment of the society. Good, all right, so Raul and Sam have made a powerful point. Who would like to reply? Who has an answer for Sam and, and Raul? Go ahead. Uh, I just, I don't think that these drafting systems are really terribly different from, you know, all volunteer army sort of recruiting strategies. Um, the whole idea of, you know, having benefits and pay for joining the army is, you know, sort of a coercive strategy to get people to um, join. Um, it is true that military volunteers come from disproportionately, you know, lower economic um, status and also, you know, from certain regions of the country where you can use like the patriotism to try and co coerce people to feel like it's the right thing to do to volunteer and go over to Iraq. You're, and tell me your name. Emily. All right, Emily says, and Raul, you're going to have to reply to this, so get ready. <laughs> Emily says, fair enough, there is a coercive element to the Civil War system when the laborer takes the place of Andrew Carnegie for $500. Emily concedes that. But she says, if that troubles you about the Civil War system, shouldn't that also trouble you about the volunteer army today? And let me, and bef before you answer, how did you vote on the first poll? Did you defend the volunteer army? I didn't vote. You didn't vote? <laughs> By the way, you didn't vote. Oh, did you sell your vote to the person sitting next to you? No. All right. So what would you say to that argument? I think that the circumstances are different in that there was cons conscription in the Civil War. There is no draft today. And I think that the volunteers for the Army today have a more profound sense of patriotism that is of an individual choice than those who were forced into the military in the Civil War. Somehow less coerced. Less coerced. Even though there is still inequality in American society, even yeah. though, as Emily points out, yeah. 
the makeup of the American military is not reflective of the population as a whole. Let's just do an experiment here. How many here um, have either served in the military or have a family member who has served in the military? In this generation, not parents, family members, in this generation. And how many have neither served nor have any brothers or sisters who have served? Does that bear out your point, Emily? Yes. All right, now we need, we need to hear from, most of you defended the idea of the, uh, of the all-volunteer military, overwhelmingly. And yet, overwhelmingly, people considered the Civil War system unjust. Sam and Raoul articulated reasons for objecting to the Civil War system. It took place against a background of inequality, and therefore the choices people made to buy their way into military service were not truly free, but at least partly coerced. Then, Emily extends that argument in the form of a challenge. All right, everyone here who voted in favor of the all-volunteer army should be able should have to explain, well, what's the difference in principle? Doesn't the all-volunteer arm, army simply universalize the feature that almost everyone found objectionable in the Civil War buyout provision? Did I state the challenge fairly, Emily? Yes. Okay. So we need to hear from a defender of the all-volunteer military who can address <coughs> Emily's challenge. Who can do that? Go ahead. The difference between the, the Civil War system and the all-volunteer army system is that in the Civil War, you're being hired not by the government, but by an individual. And, and uh, as a result, different people who get hired by different individuals get paid different amounts. In the case of the all-volunteer army, everyone who gets hired is hired by the government and gets paid the same amount. It's precisely the universalization of uh, uh, essentially paying your service, uh, you're paying your way into the army that makes the all-volunteer army just Emily? I guess I'd frame the principal difference slightly differently. Um, on the all-volunteer army, it's possible for somebody to just, you know, step aside and not really think about, you know, the war at all. It's possible to say, well, I, I don't need the money. You know, I, I don't need to have an opinion about this. I don't need to, you know, feel obligated to take my part and defend my country. With a coercive system, or, or sorry, with an explicit draft, then you know, there's the threat, at least, that every individual will have to make some sort of decision, you know, regarding military conscription. And, you know, perhaps in that way, it's more equitable. You know, it's, it's true that, you know, Andrew Carnegie might not serve in any case, but in one, you know, he can completely step aside from it. In the other, there's some level of responsibility. While you're there, Emily, so what system do you favor? Conscription? I, I would be hard pressed to say, but I think so, because it makes the whole country feel a sense of responsibility for the conflict instead of, you know, having a war that's maybe ideologically supported by a few, but only if there's no, you know, real responsibility. Good. Who wants to reply? Go ahead. Um, so I was going to say that the fundamental difference between the all-volunteer army and then the, the army in the Civil War is that in the all-volunteer army, if you want to volunteer, that comes first, and then the pay is, um, comes after. Whereas in the Civil War system, the people who are, who are accepting the pay aren't necessarily doing it because they want to. They're just doing it for the money first. What motivation beyond the pay do you think is operating in the case of the all-volunteer army? Like patriotism for the country? <laughs> patriotism. Well, what about And pay? a desire to defend the country. I mean, right. there, is, there is some motivation in pay, but the fact that, that it's first and foremost an all-volunteer army will motivate them, for, I think, personally. Do you think it's better, and tell me your name. Jackie. Jackie, do you think it's better if people serve in the military out of a sense of patriotism than just for the money? Yes, definitely, because the people who, that was one of the main problems in the Civil War Army, is that the people that you're getting to go in it, uh, or to go to war, aren't necessarily people who want to fight, and so they won't be as good soldiers as they will be had they been there because they wanted to be. 
All right, what about Jackie's ra having raised the question of patriotism? That patriotism is a better or a higher motivation than money for military service. Who, who would like to address that question? Go ahead. Patriotism absolutely is not necessary in order to be a good soldier because mercenaries can do just as good of a job of the job as anyone who waves the American flag around and wants to defend what the government believes that we should do. Did you favor the outsourcing solution? Yes, sir. <laughs> and, all right, so let Jackie, let Jackie respond. What's your name? Philip. What about that, Jackie? So much for patriotism. If you've got someone whose heart is in it more than, more than another person's, they're going to do a better job. When it comes down to the wire and there's like a situation in which someone has to put their life on the line, someone who's doing it because they love this country will be more willing to go into danger than someone who's just getting paid. They don't care. They've got the technical skills, but they don't care what happens because they really have they have nothing, like, nothing invested in this country. There's another aspect, though. Once, once we get onto the issue of patriotism, if you believe patriotism, as Jackie does, should be the foremost consideration and not money, does that argue for or against the paid army we have now? We call it the volunteer army, though if you think about it, that's a kind of misnomer. A volunteer army, is, as we use the term, is a paid army. So what about the suggestion that patriotism should be the primary motivation for military service, not money? Does that argue in favor of the paid military that we have, or does it argue for conscription? And just to sharpen that point, building on Phil's case for outsourcing, if you think that the all-volunteer army, the paid army, is best because it lets the market allocate positions according to people's preferences and willing, willingness to serve for a certain wage, doesn't the logic that takes you from a system of conscription to the hybrid civil war system, to the all-volunteer army, doesn't the the idea of expanding freedom of choice in the market, doesn't that lead you all the way if you follow that principle consistently to a mercenary army? And then if you say no, Jackie says no, patriotism should count for something. Doesn't that argue we're going back to conscription, if by patriotism you mean a sense of civic obligation. Let's, let's see if we can step back from the discussion that we've had and see what we've learned about consent as it applies to market exchange. We've really heard two arguments, two arguments against the use of markets and exchange in the allocation of military service. One was the argument raised by Sam and Raul, the argument about coercion. The objection that Letting the market allocate military service may be unfair and may not even be free if there's severe inequality in the society so that people who buy their way into military service are doing so not because they really want to, but because they have so few economic opportunities that that's their that's their best choice. And Sam and Rubble say there's an element of coercion in that. That's one argument. Then there is a second objection to using the market to allocate military service. 
That's the idea that military service shouldn't be treated as just another job for pay because it's bound up with patriotism and civic obligation. This is a different argument from the argument about unfairness and inequality and coercion. It's an argument that suggests that maybe where civic obligations are concerned, we shouldn't allocate duties and rights by the market. Now, we've identified two broad objections. What do we need to know to assess those objections? To assess the first, the argument from coercion, inequality, and unfairness, Sam, we need to ask what inequalities in the background conditions of society undermine the freedom of choices people make to buy and sell their labor? Question number one. Question number two, to assess the civic obligation patriotism argument, we have to ask, what are the obligations of citizenship? Is military service one of them or not? What obligates us as citizens? What is the source of political obligation? Is it consent? Or are there some civic obligations we have, even without consent, for living and sharing in a certain kind of society? We haven't answered either of those questions, but our debate today about the Civil War system and the all-volunteer army has at least raised them, and those are questions we're going to return to in the coming weeks. Do you think you should be able to, to bid for a baby that's up for adoption? That's Andrew's challenge. Do I think I should be able to bid for a baby? I'm not sure. It's a market. I mean, I...